Hi, how are you all doing? Well, I'm doing well because I brought my cup of tea with me. Okay, just keeps me going. That's a really nice temperature. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about inverse proportion. What do we mean by inverse proportion? Well, you probably remember direct proportion. That means when one increases, so does the other, at the same weight. Okay, so for example, if y is directly proportional to x, then as x increases, so does y. But what about inverse proportion? What does that actually mean? Well, let's take my cup of tea here as an example. Okay, at the moment, the drinking temperature for me is just about right. Okay, but what happens if I leave it longer? What happens if I leave it five minutes? Still drinkable, okay. If I leave it ten minutes, fairly warm but I can still drink it. If I left it for half an hour though, uh, no, I'm not going to enjoy it. An hour? This could taste awful. What's actually happening to the temperature of my tea as I leave it longer and longer and longer? It's decreasing, isn't it? Okay, and that's what inverse proportion is. Okay, as time increases, the temperature of my tea decreases. Okay, now inverse proportion is not solely about Mr. Brown's cup of tea. Okay, it's about anything in general, but I'm just giving you an example. Okay, inverse proportion is as one variable increases, the other one decreases. Okay, now I'm just gonna take one last sip of this and then put it down. Okay, because I'm not sure when I'm gonna be able to get a sip again because I don't normally drink tea when I'm doing my videos. Okay, um, so uh, shouldn't drink and do maths, of course. If I were to draw that in terms of a graph, what does it look like? Well, let's just have the horizontal scale being the independent variable, in this case, time. And because I was drinking tea, I'm gonna do it in minutes, because I'm interested in how the temperature changes over time. Um, in seconds, it's barely noticeable, but in minutes it is, okay? With something like temperature of tea, hours, no, because after one hour, it's already sort of gone, isn't it? And then this one will be the temperature scale. And the temperature here, we have this degrees Celsius, okay? Now, what happens is, as soon as the water is poured from the boiling kettle, okay, well, not literally boiling kettle, the boiling water is poured from the kettle, it's about 100 degrees. But then what happens is the temperature starts decreasing, doesn't it? Okay, it starts decreasing straight away. And then after a while, the tea has got to its lowest possible temperature. That's actually the ambient temperature, for example. So let's just suppose the temperature in this room was, say, 18 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the tea will never fall below that. If I took the tea outside, where actually today there's snow, okay, it might be about zero degrees, one degree outside, sometimes negative one degrees, okay, um, the temperature tea will fall to that. So the, the tea temperature will always fall to the ambient temperature, okay, never actually blow it. But what happens is it's going to look like this in terms of a graph, not a straight line, okay, not a straight line. The reason is the temperature decreases rapidly at first. As I say, it's 100 degrees. Celsius when the water leaves the kettle, okay? The temperature of the room is nowhere near that, okay? Even on a hot summer's day, it's not gonna be more than 30 degrees in my kitchen while I'm making the tea, okay? I don't have air conditioning, by the way. And the temperature's gonna drop rapidly, okay? Because there's a difference in um, temperatures between the boiling water and the outside air, okay? So the temperature drops rapidly, but then it starts to level off. And as it gets closer and closer to the outside temperature, um, it just levels off and there's a slow, decrease in temperature. So the graph looks like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the axes here. So instead of time, I'm going to write x. And instead of the temperature here, I'm going to write y. Okay? Because, well, let's face it, in mathematics we're usually happiest when dealing with x and y, aren't we? That's because we always use graphs. We have algebras involved, and we've got x, y coordinates. See, that's why x and y are generally preferred. Okay. Now, to write as a statement mathematically that y is inversely proportional to x, we write this. Y, that's the proportionality symbol, and we write one over x. Okay? That means y is inversely proportional to x. Okay. You could write that down. All right. So y is inversely proportional to x. The graph of it looks like this. Okay. And the equation is of the form y equals k over x. Now remember where k stands for the constant of proportionality, okay? So let's just contrast that with direct proportion as a recap. With direct proportion, we had this, y is, let's just write it like this first of all, y is proportional to x, or y is directly proportional to x, and the equation we had was y equals 
kx. Okay, that was with direct proportion. Okay, but with inverse proportion, it's this. Y is inverse proportional to x. It's written as y equals k of x as an equation. And this is a very typical looking graph. Okay, now despite my Yep, still drinkable, okay, but for another five minutes it won't be, okay. Now, despite my reference to the T there, okay, um, we don't actually draw the graph to the axes. Quick explanation why, okay. If we just have a look at this, is it the case that X can be zero at any stage? Can X ever be equal to zero? No, it can't. If you just try it in your calculator, if you try to type in any number, doesn't matter what it is, any number divided by zero, you can't do it, it's undefined. Okay, you cannot divide a number by zero. So I'm just going to put in there that x is never equal to zero. What about y? Can y ever equal zero? What do you reckon? And the answer is no, because k is always some value, some positive value in our syllabus anyway. Okay, um, And you're not going to be able to divide that number by any other number to get zero. So y is never equal to zero. Okay. So I'm just going to put in there that y is never zero and x is never zero either. And that's just a short explanation as to why the graph doesn't touch the axes. Because if x can't be zero, y can't be zero, you're not going to have a y coordinate of zero or an x coordinate of zero either. Okay. So that's a short introduction to inverse proportion. Okay. If thinking about my cup of tea helps you to remember this, then yeah. fair enough. Okay. That's as, as long as you remember it. Okay. But one thing you've got to remember is with inverse proportion, as one increases, the other is decreasing, okay? Now, what follows is some more examples. I'm just going to finish my tea first. Yep, still drinkable. Yep. Give it five more minutes. I'm back in five more minutes. To you, it'll be instantaneous, but I'll be back in five minutes just to finish this lovely tea. Okay, tea all finished. I'm ready to go with some examples. So, here's one example. Maybe you could note it down. Okay, so you're told y is inversely proportional to x and y equals 5 when x equals 20. A fairly standard GCSE type question. And following that, you've got to find the formula for y in terms of x, find y when x is 30, find x when y equals 2. We're not going through these examples. You've got a choice. You can either work through them with me or you can pause the video, see if you can work it out yourself, then unpause it and see if you've got it right. Okay, whichever one you feel happiest with, then um, you can do that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, just remind you about the general formula connecting y and x when it's inversely proportional. Okay? When it's inversely proportional to x, it's y equals k over x. That's your starting point. Okay? When it's inversely proportional to x, that's your starting point. You write down that. Okay? And then you substitute in the known values. y is 5, and you're told that x is equal to 20. Okay. So you're going to find what k is when 5 is equal to k divided by 20. Okay. And so if you just multiply both sides by 20, put the 20 into that side, you'll have k is equal to 5 times 20, which is 100. Okay. Makes sense, doesn't it? 100 divided by 20 is 5. And then because it's my final answer, I'm going to write down the therefore symbol. Therefore, and then final answer, y is equal to k, which is now 100, over x. Okay. That's my answer, and that's the formula I'm going to be using to answer the rest of the question. Okay, the rest of the question is going to be about now using that formula y equals 100 over x. Okay, now let's have a look at part b. So I'm going to answer that up here. Find y when x equals 30. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 100 divided by 30, and then work out what that is. Okay. So calculator if you want, or without a calculator. You can see 100 divided by 30 is the same as 10 over 3, 10 thirds. That will do as your answer, 10 thirds. Or if you want, write it as 3 and a third, or 3.3 .3 recurring. Do not forget the recurring there, because it's got to be an exact answer. Okay. So I'm going to write 10 thirds, um, or I'm going to write 3 and 1 third. 3.3 okay. .3 recurring, if you wish. And then part C find x when y equals 2, so you've got 2 is equal to 100 over x. Now, these can be slightly more challenging as an equation because you want to work out x's, but it's on the bottom of the fraction, so on the denominator of a fraction. Okay. Let me just show you a neat trick you can do in this case. 
you just swap these two over. Okay. So what I mean is write the x up there and write the 2 down by there. Okay, you can just swap those over. And then when you do this, you get 100 divided by 2. The answer is x equals 50. Okay, why does the swapping over work? Well, it works because um, if you bring the x over to that side, if you multiply by x, you'll get 2x, aren't you? It's just right down by there. You get 2x is equal to 100. Okay. And then if you put the 2 onto that side, your x equals 100 over 2. So if you want, what I'm doing is I'm just skipping out that stage. To go from here to here, I'm just skipping out that stage. Okay? But if you remember that technique, just swapping these two over, then that can just save you a little bit of time. Okay? I'm hoping you found that example useful. Um, if you need to, just play it again. Okay? Play it again. But there's another example coming right up. Next example. Y is inversely proportional to the square of x. Y is 0 0.02 when x is 10. Find a formula for y in terms of x. Find y when x is 2. So you notice from the previous example, I've still got to underline this bit, because sometimes in a question, it's directly proportional. Just remember that. What we're doing today in this video is just inverse proportion, but in a GC exam, it could be either directly or inversely. So it's important to underline whether it's inverse proportion or direct proportion. Okay? If it's inverse proportion, you're doing the methods that we're talking about in this video. Now, can you notice here, it says it's inversely proportional to the square of x. Okay? It's not inversely proportional to x this time, it's just inversely proportional to the square of x. And what we mean by the square of x is that, isn't it? We mean by x squared. So that's important because in our formula, what we're going to write down is this. We're going to write down that y is equal to k over x squared. Okay, y equals k over x when it's inversely proportional to x, but y equals k over x squared when it's inversely proportional to x squared. You remember that with direct proportion. Okay, you've got to know whether it's x, x squared, x cubed, square root of x, and so on. Okay? So once you've got that, we can then go ahead with the rest of the question. So y is 0 0.02, and x is 10, so let's just fill those in. Remember you've got a square 10, so 10 squared is 100, and now you can work out what the value of k is. Okay? So just do 100 times by 0 0.02, and then k is equal to 2. You can then write down, therefore, y is equal to 2 over x squared. Okay? And that's our formula that we're going to be using for the rest of this question. And there's only one more part of the question, okay? because to be honest, I just want to focus on this bit, the formula setting up. That's b, find y over x is 2. Okay? So y is equal to 2 divided by 2 squared. Remember, with a question like this, you've always got to be squaring the value of x. So 2 squared is 4, so y equals 2 over 4. That's nice and simple, isn't it? So y is equal to 1 half, okay? And that's that. Okay, let's do one more example then in inverse proportion. So this time, y varies inversely as the square root of x and y equals 5 and x equals 16. Let's just focus on this then. So this is just written slightly differently. This is another way of saying y is inversely proportional to something. So when it says y varies inversely, it's just another way of saying it, okay? That's why I've worded it this way. It's basically saying y is inversely proportional to something. And then it says it's inversely proportional to the square root of x, okay? The square root of x. So this time what we're saying is that y is equal to k over, and instead of x or square of x, it's square root of x. So k over square root of x. That's the formula we'll be using. Now let's go to pause there for a moment and just show you these general results, which you may want to take a note of. It just covers a few possibilities. So all of these are saying that y is inversely proportional to something. And notice that what we're doing to represent that is we've got 1 over something, okay? So when you've got 1 over something, it's inverse proportional. So y is inverse proportional to x. The formula is y equals k over x. y is inverse proportional to x squared. y equals k over x squared. In this case, this example, y is inverse proportional to the square root of x. y equals k over root x. You can just make a note of those. 
And of course, you can change these. You could have y is inverse proportional to x cubed. Looks similar to this one, doesn't it? In which case, the formula y equals k over x cubed. So just some other important um, ideas for you there. So let's continue with this. So we got inversely proportional to the square root of x. So y equals k over root x. Then we just put the numbers in. Okay, we just put the numbers in. So x equals 16 and y equals 5. So you've got 5 is equal to k over, and we need to square root 16. Okay, so square root 16 is 4, and so then you must have k is equal to 20. All right, and then we'll just write down our formula. y is equal to 20 over square root of x. And I'll just highlight that because that's the formula we'll need to use throughout the rest of the question now, okay? You can see why it's important to get this formula correct, because if you've got that wrong, then you're not going to get uh, anything here, okay? So let's look at part B. We need to find y when x is 36. So here you'll appreciate the fact that um, 16 is a square number and 36 is a square number. Just makes it easier when you substitute it in here, because you'd have to square root those again. So y is equal to 20 over the square root of 36. The square root of 36 is 6. So y equals 20 over 6. Okay. So as a fraction, that would be 10 over 3, or 3 and a third. I believe I've had that come up in a previous example. Coincidence. Okay. Um, I'm just going to write it in as 3 and 1 third, like that. Okay. And then next, part C. Find x when y is 5 over 3. So y this time is 5 over 3. And that's equal to 20 over square root of x. Now, a couple of ways of doing this. Remember I spoke to you about just swapping those two numbers over? You can do that, okay? So if you want, let me just put it in here in blue, just swap these two over. You've got square root of x is equal to 20, and then this would be 5 over 3, won't it? And you just work out what that is in your calculator, of course. You work out what 20 divided by 5 thirds actually is. But you can do it without a calculator. Um, let me just show you quickly how you could do that without a calculator. So here we are, 20, and you're dividing by 5 thirds. Remember how to do that with fractions? So you make it 20 multiplied by 3 over 5. Remember, take the reciprocal there and turn that into multiplication. And then 20 times by 3 over 5. I'm going to do 20 divided by 5 first, because that's easy. It's 4, and 4 times 3 is 12. Okay? Or you just use your calculator, of course, which is what some of you will probably do. And you get 12. Okay? And then to find out x's, you square both sides. You do x is equal to 144. You can check that, of course, when you put 144 in here, square root of 144 is 12, 20 divided by 12 and you get the um, value of 5 and 3. I did say there's an alternative way of doing that, okay? And the alternative way of doing that is to do this. I'll just rub this off a bit. And, yeah. So I wrote down 5 over 3 is equal to 20 over square root of x. When you have a fraction is equal to another fraction, you can take the reciprocal of both sides. Only when you've got one fraction equals another fraction. If you've got more terms than that. You can take the reciprocal of both sides. What that means is turn this one upside down and turn this one upside down, like that. Okay, and then you've got the x on the top, which might make it easier for you. Then you put the 20 over to that side. So you do 3 fifths times by 20. You work out what that is. Um, so 3 fifths times by 20, that uh, also gives you 12. And then you've got 12 equals the square root of x. Square both sides, you get 144. So a couple of ways I've been able to work through that, okay? All right, that was my last example. I'm hoping you found it useful. I'm hoping it was helpful to you. The next thing, of course, is to practice as many questions as you can. Okay, good luck with that. I'll see you again.